introducing to you today, um, Alexander Kasar. Uh, Professor Kasar is the author of numerous books, including The Right to Vote, which was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and won the Beverage Award from the American Historical Association. He is Matthew J. Sterling Jr. Professor of History and Social Policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. He will be in conversation tonight with Jamel Bowie. Jamel is a columnist for the New York Times and political analyst for CBS News. He covers campaigns, elections, national affairs, and culture. Prior to the time, Jamel was chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine. And before that, he was a staff writer at the Daily Beast and had fellowships at the American Prospect and the Nation Magazine. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia uh, with a degree in political and social thought and government. Uh, without any further ado, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Professor Kesar, for, for being here. Thank you to everyone tuned in for uh, participating in this conversation. We both look forward to the questions you have later. Um, to, to start, just to give viewers a sense of what the book is about, um, I'm going to ask you a question, Professor Kesar. Uh, the book is titled, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? I assume this isn't a book uh, that is out to praise and defend the Electoral College as you know, the great institution of American democracy. I'm not sure that you would title the book that way if that were your intention. Could, so could you say a little bit about what you are arguing uh, to a reader? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Let me begin by also th by thanking Jamel uh, for joining this conversation and, and thanks to the people at Politics and Prose uh, for arranging it. And before I turn to the question itself, I, I can't resist telling a very brief story, which was that when the right to vote was published 20 years ago, I was also invited to do a book talk or a, co a conversation at Politics and Prose. And I was, I was living in North Carolina at the time and I flew up to Washington, arrived uh, hours early. I think my event was at six or seven. Um, I wanted to be sure that I got there in time. And I got to the bookstore at about 4.30 or 5, and I noticed a long line of people snaking out of the bookstore. And I thought, oh my God, I've really broken into some new level of popularity. There are people at 5 o'clock waiting to get into this event. It turned out that they were there to hear Senator Bill Bradley, who had also just published a book, and he was <laughs> doing the 5 o'clock event. Oh. Anyway, let me go, go back to... You're quite good question. No, this is this isn't a book designed to say um, to, to praise and defend the Electoral College. Um, somebody at my publisher staff at one point did a typo and called it why we still have the Electoral College, which implied less of a question mark and more of a defense. And I quickly corrected that. Um, I didn't set out to write. I, I, this is not a defense of the Electoral College, not by any means. It's also not a book whose focus is to say the Electoral College is bad and lay out the ways in which uh, that is the case. Um, it's that book has that book Electoral College is bad has been written scores of times and I didn't see that I had much to add uh, to, to, to that conversation. What, what, what I wanted to really try to focus on in a way was a puzzle which was we have this very unpopular institution. It's unpopular today. It has been unpopular for a very long time. Um, and what started me off on it was on, on this on this project uh, was learning was learning more more dimensions of the puzzle. I wanted to try to explain why we still have it, given that it doesn't conform to basic American democratic values. According to public opinion polls, uh, most Americans have long wished that uh, we would get rid of it. Um, and in fact, more resolutions have been introduced in Congress to change or abolish the Electoral College than on any other subject. There's between 900 and 1,000 of them, and they started in 1800. So that, 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 you know, that, 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 that suggests 
something problematic about the institution in addition to the, the flaws of it that we're aware of and that we, that we can talk about. So it became an attempt to, uh, to explain the persistence. It's a, I mean, it's an odd subject in a sense for a historian. Historians usually try to explain change. I'm trying to explain why there was no change uh, and no change within an institution that from the outset was sharply crit criticized. So let's um, let's start from the beginning then. If if beginning in 1800, at the very start of the republic, there are these this is push this push to get rid of the electoral college. What is it from the start that is sort of uh, driving the opposition? Why 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 so soon after the ratification of the constitution? Um, do we have Americans saying this was a terrible idea? <laughs> right. um, well, one short term reason was that the way the system was originally designed, each elector casts two ballots and didn't specify um, which was for the president, which was for vice president. And that led to a smash up in 1800 and led to the one change that has ever been made, which was the 12th Amendment, um, which said that you know, electors cast a vote for president and a vote for vice president. But that wasn't the major source of discontent. The major source of discontent was that the, the constitution leaves it to the legislatures of each state to decide how electors will be chosen. And the legislatures were doing varied things. Uh, they sometimes had popular elections um, where in the entire uh, allotment of a state's electoral votes were cast for one person. That's what we recognize today as winner take all. It was called the general ticket then. In a number of states, they did district elections, which most of the framers really thought was what was going to happen, where you chose electors by district. Um, and in a number of states, legislatures just chose electors by themselves. Uh, and so not only was there not uniformity, but then uh, states kept change, state legislatures kept changing the way they chose electors because they were gaming the system for particular, uh, for particular elections. And that it was both chaotic and seemed unprincipled. Um, so on that, on that point, Part of the explanation here, um, or, or sorry, part of what's happening here too is that the Electoral College is more than just the electors, right? It's this entire process of things that happen. Right. No, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I, and I think it's very important that we not think of the Electoral College as just these electors or these electors meeting in, the, in their state capitals. That, um, I mean, here I can do I can do a short summary of it, but you can't do a short summary of it, and that's part of the problem, um, <laughs> which which is um, that you know this is a presidential election system. By the way, the term electoral college does not appear in the Constitution and doesn't really become common until the 20th century. Um, but it's it's a system where each state gets that the presidents are elected by electoral votes most of the time. Um, each state gets a number of electoral votes. Uh, to match its representation in Congress in both the House and the Senate. State legislatures decide how those uh, electors will be chosen within each state, and they can change it from time to time. Um, once that happens, then the electors meet in their state capitals X number of weeks later to cast their ballots or to possibly engage in disputes over whose ballots are legitimate, then the, then, um, the results of that are forwarded to Congress where the results, where, where they are tallied, where the votes are counted. And it's not really quite clear who does the counting. They're sent to Congress. It's not clear who in Congress, this could be an issue um, that, 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 that we might encounter. And then, you know, and then if, it's, if there's a clear majority, well, then that's that. But there's also a piece of this institution called the contingent election system, which is what happens if nobody wins a majority, or actually if two people receive a tie, um, and even if they both have majorities, which happened in the past. Um, and in that case, 
the election reverts immediately to the House of Representatives, who choose, which chooses the president according to a very odd decision rule. Each state gets one vote. So Vermont and California uh, get one vote. So it's this whole intricate system with human electors, chains of activity, um, places where the rules can change in between. It's a very Byzantine system. I, my understanding is that the uh, framers didn't actually expect anyone to ever win an outright majority uh, in sort of first balloting. They kind of expected the House would be the institution that actually ended up choosing the president much of the time. They weren't of one mind about that exactly. Many, many of them believed exactly as uh, you know as you thought. Some people thought that the electors would, you know, that it would produce majorities. But many thought that that the electors and the popular elections, if they were held, would serve as a kind of nominating board, and then the House uh, would choose would choose the president, and that that would happen very often. As it turned out, it happened twice. It seems like part of what happened from the conception to um, kind of the present day, or even, even not even the present day, even shortly thereafter, <laughs> is that po political parties happen. And this is a system that's not really designed to accommodate political parties. And so it, is, it, is, is what's happening in the, you know, the 1810s, 1820s, 1830s, um, ba basically various actors trying to accommodate the fact that political parties exist that electors are expected to vote with political parties, that the whole rationale of like independent deliberation just ceases to exist once political parties enter the scene. No, you're, you're absolutely right. There were, I mean, there were no political parties as such when the framers met in Philadelphia in 1787. They did not think there would be, and they did not think that there should be political parties uh, either. And they, they saw themselves in part as designing a system that would deter parties uh, but in fact, it ended up doing the opposite. And so part of what they're wrestling with in the 1790s and in the 1800 crisis election and in the years thereafter is that parties do exist and parties are organizing it. It, it takes, you know, th there's an ironic thing here, which is that given the nature of the electoral system where, you know, if, if you have a candidate or if you're a candidate, if I decide to run for president in 1796 or 1800, I have to try to get enough electoral votes uh, and, or, or to sort of get it to the house, which means I have to try to organize the state legislatures. I have to sort of find supporters in the state legislatures who will choose the appropriate method of choosing electors. I have to find electors. Um, and if it's, we're looking to the House, I have to sort of mobilize people in the, in the House of Representatives. It required a party to do that. Uh, you couldn't just do that by sitting at home and issuing nice letters um, saying, here are my views. Um, so that it put a premium on having parties and then, and then parties come into existence and they start gaming the system right away and doing so quite successfully. It's, you know, it's notable that uh, between 1815 and 1826, I mean, as one indicator of, this, of this, the scope of the discontents, the Senate passed constitutional amendments four times in that period to, uh, to ban the use of winner take all and to mandate that all states use uh, district elections, and then on a couple of those instances, to also revamp the contingent election system to make it more proportional to population. On one of those occasions, in 1821, the, the re a resolution for a resolution for a constitutional amendment fell short of the two-thirds majority by only uh, by only a handful of votes. So we came very close to having this whole system transformed in the early 1820s. Could you, could you say a little, so we've talked a bit about how it was originally designed. We sort of mentioned the ways in which that's not the case. It's not the system that we have. Could you, so could you say a little about sort of the points at which the Electoral College changed or, or how we got to the Electoral College we have now, which it obviously isn't independent electors, is winner take all, is, you know, all these other than a couple of states, is this um, very distinct thing from what's present in the Constitution? I think that, um, um, well, it, it happens in a couple of stages. The first is 
that it, we, you know, there's evidence that the framers thought that the electors would deliberate uh, when chosen, that these would be respectable people who would go to their state capitals and, and talk about who should be president and deliberate. That never happened. So, you know, the original design, you know, there's, there's almost no evidence of any state gathering uh, deliberating. By 1796, they're widely referred to as messengers, and that's all, and thus they're unnecessary. <clears throat> the next big shift is the adoption of winner-take-all, uh, and that's a really big change. And it's fought and contested um, and resisted <coughs> in one state after another and in Congress. Um, until the resistance crumbles in the late 1820s, by which time almost all states had adopted a general ticket or, or winner take all. And by 1832, I think, I think the last holdout, which was Maryland, uh, decided to, uh, you know, to abandon the district system and use winner take all. And that the combination of, of those things, electors as messengers um, and um, you know, and, and winner take all really provide much of the basic and enduring shape of the electoral college. The third ingredient is that through the formation of parties and the emergence of two party systems, which are also partly enforced by the nature of our congressional elections of having first past the post single member districts in a two party system, the odds of an election going to the House are greatly reduced. I mean, what the framers were anticipating was something that I think looked more like a student council election, you know, where <laughs> five or six or seven, you know, popular folks would run maybe eight or nine, and the electoral colleges would winnow it down to, uh, you know, to, to three, and, and, then, and then that would go to the House. Um, but once you had a two-party system and winner take all, I think much of the rest of the operation of the system was locked in. When did sort of popular, popularly elected electors show up, actual people voting like today, like next week, people voting for electors instead of a state legislature choosing or, um, or some other sort of system? They show up in some states right away in the, uh, in the early uh, 1790s. The electors have to show up the and, and vote. The question is how they're chosen. Um, and in some states, they're chosen through popular election right at the beginning. Um, Virginia holds elections uh, right at the beginning. I think Maryland does um, pretty often. Other states take a while. I don't, th if I recall this correctly, I don't think New York state had a popular presidential election as opposed to the legislature choosing until 1828. Uh, that's a pretty long time. I believe South Carolina was choosing, the legislature was choosing electors up until the Civil War. Yes, I, I, yes, that's exactly right. South Carolina, South Carolina led the way in clinging to the old. Uh, so you, you said that uh, in the 1820s, there are attempts to reform the system. There have been hundreds of uh, amendments, uh, proposed amendments to try to reform the system. Um, this is all in the 19th century. What does the 20th century look like? Are Americans just kind of resigned to it by then, or are there efforts for reform throughout the 20th century as well? No, there are. They're, they're, they're not resigned. There is, there, there is a period. I mean, let me let me sketch this out a little bit. There's a period in the first half of the 20th century. It actually begins a little earlier. You know, arguably in the late 1880s, the early 1890s, when there is relative political stasis on this, not, not because they're, uh, everybody's contented and amendments keep being introduced they, every time there's a problematic election, which is fairly often. So you still see amendments, you still see proposals. But two things, or, or one thing happens at the, uh, at the end of the 19th century that, that ends up shaping the debates really for the next 50 years, maybe a little bit more. And that is the disenfranchisement of African Americans in the South and the coming to power of the Democratic Party in a basically one party region. Um, and that has two consequences. The first is that Southern Democrats, who are now, by the way, you know, by after the Civil War in this period, 
states are getting full representation for their entire African-American population, not just for three fifths of their slaves. So they're getting more representation, yet African-Americans are disenfranchised again. So basically white Southerners are getting a benefit of what amounted to a five fifths clause. Okay, well, given that structure and that advantage, Southern Democrats, the whole Southern wing of the Democratic Party becomes ferociously opposed to anything that might resemble a national popular vote. Um, and they wield a kind of veto power on that. But at the same time, a, a, a twist to the story that I had not expected is that the Republican Party at the end of the 19th century also does a change. Large elements of the Republican Party, and this I think comes out in part, uh, it comes in part out of the abolitionist, pro-democratic, radical reconstruction wing of the party. They had been in favor of electoral college reform, mostly focusing on having district elections again, or maybe maybe proportional elections. You, you a candidate gets a, per, a percentage of the electoral vote of each state, depending on the per, percentage of the popular vote. Proportional voting seemed superior because it didn't have gerrymandering. But the Republicans strongly supported that into the 1870s. And by the early 1890s, uh, that disappears. Why does it disappear? Because they conclude that if they move to a district or proportional system, they will lose about 40% maybe 45% of their electoral votes in, in key Northern states in the Midwest, but they will gain nothing in return in the South because in effect, the Republican party has been frozen out. So what you have is large wings, you know, not everybody, large wings of each party opposing reform uh, for somewhat different reasons, but then things shift. I mean, to, you know, to return to your original question, does nothing happen in the 20th century? No, then things shift in important ways starting in the 1940s. Um, there are significant movements for proportional um, and district elections, although those are impacted in Congress. And I think most significantly from our point of view, uh, people start to, there start to appear strong advocates of a national popular vote. And one of the strongest advocates, um, and this is related to one of the things that in the book that uh, where I take aim at conventional wisdom. One of the strongest advocate is, is Senator William Langer of North Dakota, a very small state. There is a conventional wisdom, as you know, that we don't have electoral reform because the small states would resist it. Um, it turns out that's simply not true. <laughs> and one sign of this was William Langer from the small state of North Dakota carrying the banner for a national popular vote, and then is assisted by John Pastore from Rhode Island, uh, another very small state. What, what happens then in, the, in this move in the 40s and 50s is a weird development in 1950 where a coalition of Southern segregationists and moderate Republicans passes a resolution, but then it disappears. But let's put that aside for the moment. In the 1960s, uh, support for a national popular vote begins to cascade. And it's doing that for numerous reasons. One is I think there actually is a genuine expansion of or a deepening of democratic ideology in the wake of World War II, and maybe a little bit uh, in terms of the Cold War in, in its own complicated uh, ways. But, uh, you know, this is, the, and this is the period obviously of the civil rights and voting rights uh, movements. It's also the period when the Supreme Court gets involved in the apportionment of legislative districts, both for Congress and for state legislatures. And in a series of cases, um, delivers the, uh, the declaration that, the, that, of, that all legislatures should be governed by one person, one vote that all votes should count equally, which was not the case in most legislatures up to that time. That slogan, one person, one vote was very powerful. And even though the Supreme Court had a little asterisk disclaimer saying, ah, this doesn't apply to the Senate or the Electoral College, it was, the idea was contagious in a way. I mean, if, it, if, if, one, if one person, one vote um, is the principle, why doesn't the principle apply to the single most important election uh, that occurs? 
And that, that feeds what's going on inside and outside of Congress. Um, outside of Congress, a variety of prestigious organizations with different political identifications come, start to support a national popular vote. The American Bar Association does a big study and comes out and supports it. The US Chamber of Commerce supports it. Uh, the major unions and the AFL-CIO uh, support it, the League of Women Voters. Um, so there, there is support building and within Congress, um, progressive Democrats, at the time they were called liberal Democrats, but progressive, progressive Democrats, and moderate, you know, Republicans um, embrace this. They're led by Emanuel Seller in the House, uh, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and by a young Indiana senator uh, named Birch Bayh, who, who happens to chair, or he tried, he actually sought this position. Uh, he was the chair of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments um, of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, by who had not favored significant reform until then, changes his mind in 1965, 1966. Meanwhile, other things are going on as well. I mean, to, to lead to the dissatisfactions. There have been more and more faithless electors from the 40s to the 60s. They're mostly Southerners who don't want, Southern Democrats who don't want to vote for Northern Democratic uh, candidates. The 1948 election with four candidates uh, threatened to uh, turn the election over to the House of Representatives, uh, which nobody thought was a really good idea. The 1960 election came very close to being, and maybe was a wrong winner election. And it, it's not clear who won the popular vote, uh, but even if John Kennedy did win the popular vote, it was by a whisker of a margin. And then George Wallace is running for president again in 1968 and looks like he could be a kingmaker with the electoral college. So all these forces are converging the upshot, uh, it's a long answer to your question, but the story is, the story. <laughs> it's a very interesting story. And I have a few questions to jump off, of, but please continue. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, I realize I'm going on here, but it is a good story. It's an important story. Um, is that in the September of 1969, the House of Representatives approves a constitutional amendment for a national popular vote to replace the electoral college by an 83% vote. I mean, 83%, you know, you, you, uh, in today's world, you couldn't get 83% of, of the House to agree on what day it was. Um, <laughs> and uh, so th they do that. And it looks like the thing is going to pass. It, lo it looks like, it, you know, it's, it's strength in the Senate um, and getting it ratified by the states would be tricky, but it's, it's, there, it's support. Johnson has, has approved it a little grudgingly before he left office. Nixon agrees to support it even more grudgingly, but he does agree to support it. And then it goes to the Senate. And in the Senate, it gets stalled for a year. Uh, and I tell the story in some detail, which I want to hear, but it has a lot to do with regional tensions and regional tensions over race. Um, and the fact that the uh, Judiciary Committee is chaired by a powerful Mississippi Senator. Um, and then eventually by maneuvers to bring it up, to bring it to the floor of the Senate. And what happens there is that it is defeated by a filibuster led by Southern senators by, uh, you know, I don't know how many people in the audience are of the right age to remember this, but Sam Irvin, our warm, cuddly uh, lawyer from Watergate, who was also a dedicated segregationist, Strom Thurmond, Eastland himself, and many other Southerners with the help of a few conservative Midwestern uh, uh, senators. And they keep it from coming up for a vote uh, in 1970. They're, the Bay and his allies are fall about four or five votes short of being able to cut off debate. One thing that sticks out to me in this story is how much the fortunes of the Electoral College seem to be tied to sort of flux and change in the party system itself. That there are these moments when, you know, the party system becomes unsettled and all of a sudden the, there's no clear advantage within the Electoral College. And it's at those moments that there is these push, a push for reform. No, I, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Or, or it's at those moments that the push 
can get a little further. I mean, it, during even during this first period that I talked about, 1815 to 1825, that was largely, you know, the period that historians call, you know, the era of good feelings. Really, there was only one party, it was the Republican Party. There were different factions. The Democrats, but there, the the Federalists had collapsed by uh, by that point. And in this 1960s, 1970s period, um, and I think you're right on target there. Um, there isn't a real two-party system in the United States in 1967 or 1970. The Democratic Party is not a unified party. It's got, to put it most simply, it's got Northern wings and Southern wings, and even Lyndon Johnson can't hold it all together. And the Republican Party also has conservative and more moderate wings. And then, of course, what's going on, and this carries over into the 70s where there's another attempt to get rid of the electoral college. What's going on, of course, is that the Southern Democrats are migrating into the Republican Party. So both parties are significantly in flux. And I think that does open the space uh, for reform. And looking a little bit ahead in the story, I, you know, I'm a historian, I, 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 I prefer to predict the past rather than the future, but um, it doesn't seem out of the question that we might in the not too distant future um, be in a period of party flux again or fluxes and party alignments. And that might open some space uh, for this subject to come up. I, I, that was sort of the direction I was gonna go in since you know, after after the 70s, after 1980, it seems like the party, the, the party coalitions are pretty much, if not set in stone, it's sort of all the actions happening on the margins. Right. And so in that period, it would make sense that you wouldn't be even be able to get buy-in from one party or the other to to move to a national popular vote because it's like, well, hey, we're doing we're already doing fine under the current system. But should that suddenly change? And then should it be the case that it's kind of difficult to predict who would be advantaged by electoral college in the future, then you might see, 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 see a greater willingness to, um, to adopt reform. Oh, I, you know, I, w once again, I agree. Um, <laughs> I'm, being, to being too, I'm not being disputatious enough with you, uh, Jamel, but yes, I mean, you know, we, it's, and it's something, you know, again, I don't know, I can't see the, whether how much gray hair there is in the audience or not, um, or, you know, or young people, but um, I think a lot of the pessimism in recent years that people have felt about electoral college reform comes from the fact that since 1980, we have been in a prolonged 40 year period when one party, the Republican Party, has basically opposed uh, electoral college reform. And it's really hard, and, and they've had significant strength in Congress. So it's really hard to do this um, with one party really digging in its heels. Um, and that has been the case. And again, this, it seems to me possible that things might shift uh, in the not too distant future. So the, the, the story of electoral college reform doesn't end in the 1970s, it continues on. What, but this sort of the modern, I'm, I'm 33, I was born in 1987. What does the, the picture for someone my age look like? Look like? What, what, is, what are the key events and what are the, um, the movements happening to, to push for reform? In, in, in more recent years. In more recent years. Um. Well, the um, the single most prominent, most well-known effort um, is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. This was launched in 2006, um, and in uh, you know, in many respects, I think it reflects uh, a pessimism about ever being able to get a constitutional amendment passed. Uh, in getting the super majorities that you would need for that. So it is a compact uh, for people who in the audience who don't know, it's a, it is an interstate compact where a state joins the compact and says that it will cast its electoral votes. That as soon as the compact takes effect, it will cast its electoral votes for the candidate who wins the national popular vote, not the state popular vote. And, it, and the compact will take effect when states with 270 electoral votes have joined. Um, so it is a way, it, you know, it's, uh, people, it has been criticized for uh, being an end run around the constitution, but as some of its supporters have said, an end run is a perfectly legal play in football. Um, 
And so in that, the, the compact has been around since 2006. It has gained strength, um, a lot of strength between 2006 and 2014. The rate of increase has stalled a little bit since then. Now it has the support of states with, uh, I think it's 195 or 196 electoral votes. All the states that have joined it so far are blue states. Um, and it's, it's not clear what will happen politically with this in the future. Um, and there are also a, a host of legal and constitutional questions that people have raised about whether, about whether it can be done or whether it can be done without the consent of Congress. Um, but this is a path and also is a display of the strength of uh, electoral college reform sentiment. And that's the largest movement out there um, as an organization. There are a number of other kind of shorter and trimmer versions of this. You know, some folks were playing around for a while with the plan. That if we could get Ohio to agree to just vote for the national popular vote winner, it might transform the whole, whole uh, election campaigns. Um, so there are ideas floating around. I also found that notable though that um, in the Democratic primaries, uh, a number of the candidates for president were uh, out front supporting the replacement of the Electoral College with a national popular vote. I mean, I, I think Elizabeth Warren was the first person who went out and staked that out. And then Bernie Sanders, not surprisingly, also supported it, um, as did several of the other candidates. So, uh, you know, there are there, there are efforts of different kinds being made. I know you, you don't want to predict the future or, or, <laughs> or project the future, but kind of looking, you know, looking ahead at next week, you know, states like Texas are, um, are uh, competitive, Georgia's competitive, sort of uh, states that were formerly solid red are now competitive. Um, I wonder if you think that those the, the, the emergence of party comp serious party competition in those states might be the thing that kind of makes an additional push because from the perspective of a Republican, right, you might be able to you probably you you could win a, a, a national popular vote election, um, maybe not easily, but it's like not it's it's one hundred percent doable. But if Texas becomes a swing state under an electoral college. All of a sudden, your your avenues to winning narrow considerably. Oh uh, no, absolutely. I mean, look, I uh, and and actually, the the examples you use are the same examples that I've used in um, in other uh, pieces that I've written since then. I mean, Texas and Georgia, above all, and they may not be the only ones. I mean, if they turn purple or slightly blue and, and you know and then one can read trends as well as the results of this election winner take all has got to look less attractive to republicans um you know that uh if they don't get any electoral votes out of texas um you know that that's that's a big deal so i th i think that you know and, and and historically i mean looking at the historical record people have changed that calculus uh before i mean i referred earlier to the way in which the Republicans switched from wanting districts to saying no districts. Um, those kinds of shifts do happen. I mean, here, here's my other example of a, a more optimistic note that change is possible. When a national popular vote constitutional amendment came up for a vote in the Senate in 1956, it got 17 votes, not, not, not a strong mandate. 14 years later, in 1970, it got 57 votes, uh, plus a couple of absentees. That's a big swing in a short period of time. And I think that that if what is going on in in, the, uh, in states, um, you know, like like Georgia and Texas, if if this materializes or when it materializes, I I think it may it may change the calculus. But you know, then too, you know. Politicians in looking at these things can often tend to be quite short-sighted. And one of my favorite stories, if you'll allow me to stretch my time on the air, and um, although, um, and I think it was in after the 2012 election, 
there were some Republicans, including I think Reince Priebus, who were promoting the idea of trying to get states in this, you know, the tier of northern states to get rid of winner take all and adopt districts. Okay, and they wanted to do this in Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Minnesota, and elsewhere. It, it didn't get very far, but they had Republican uh, legislatures there, and they thought that they could pull it off, and that way they could break down the blue wall that the Democrats had. Well, of course, if they had succeeded, Trump would have lost the 2016 election. Uh, so you don't always get it right. Right. I mean, this one thing I feel like it's worth noting in all of this is that, you know, one thing the Electoral College does in terms of um, our politics is it creates the impression that entire states are just uniform, right? So the example of Texas is a good one. It creates the impression, a red Texas creates the impression that Texas is just sort of, you know, 90-10 Republican. But even at its most Republican, it, it's, you know, it's 55-45, it's 57-43, it's not... No, there are very few places in the country that are uniformly or even you know, super majority one party or the other. And it seems like the Electoral College obscures this, this kind of truth of American politics. Yeah. No, I, th I, I remember some years ago, and this, this being brought home to me or, or sort of shaking my head and making me realize um, when I, I think it was probably your newspaper um, many years ago, did a, a map after an election. Um, that showed uh, that showed blue and red by county, not by state, um, and that's precisely you see that whole sort of uh, pattern, that scattering. You see these red states in the middle of the country, but with blue all along the major rivers. Uh, and you know, yes, I, I think that um, I think that the electoral college and their tendency to think in terms of st states of that sort. Uh, I, th I think it's damaging to the way we think about national politics and uh, and the appropriate coalitions of national politics too. Can you say more about that? Can you just say the way, like, say how you think it's damaging? I think that um, it leads us. Um, I think it leads us to think in terms of coalitions that are coalitions of the red, or coal and coalitions of the blue, um, or in some sense that spreads out to being regional coalitions rather than, you know, cross-cutting, rather than if I'm in a Massachusetts Congress person and I have an idea for something, my, my reflex isn't to reach out to somebody in Georgia uh, to, you know, to work with me on that. And I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 think that's, I, think, I think that's, I think that's not a good thing. Um, I mean, the other thing which happens, of course, is that, uh, you know, in the less seemly features of, uh, uh, you know, American political life with the allotment of federal resources to different, it, it, it's also apportioned by states, depending on whether they appear red or blue, or whether they're swing states um, or, uh, or shore states. Uh, it, that just, it makes me, um, it reminds me of the, uh, constitutional convention debates where I think Madison makes the observation in response to, I think they're arguing over equal state representation in this small state, big state divide. And Madison makes the observation that, you know what, just because two states are small doesn't mean they have anything in common. Yeah. Just because two states are big doesn't mean they have anything in common. That what, what's in common are, are things like, you know, are you next to a port? Are you, what's the, what's the religious composition? These things, the, the, each state has considerable diversity and, you know, I, in Virginia, Western Virginia may have more in common with sort of Northern rural California than it does with another part of Virginia. And that kind of thing is true all over the country. Right. And that was always, or and it became very strongly, one of the arguments to have district elections rather than winner take all, you know. Um, let the diversity of a state be represented in the diversity of its electoral votes. Um, so we have some questions here, and uh, I'm going to um, uh, run through some of them. If you are uh, watching, listening, please continue asking questions uh, because uh, they're always fun to answer. 
So one question kind of deals with the logistics of a national popular vote, should it happen? Obviously, this is from John Minot. Um, I, hopefully, I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, obviously, a popular vote would be worlds better than the Electoral College, but then you still have the spoiler problem where someone can move 45 versus two candidates, 40 and 15. Are we doomed to be stuck with first past the post indefinitely until, unless some, something changes, or is there any space to move to ranked choice or two round or something better? Very good question. Um, and that's an issue which actually bedeviled the national popular vote advocates in the 1960s and 1970s about, you know, well, do you have a 40% threshold? Is that too little or is that too, uh, you know, too much? Or do you have a second round election? Um, my, my intuition on this, and it may just be because I live in Massachusetts and I, I'm not getting around as much as I ought to. Um, my is that is that ranked choice voting is an idea whose time has come um, and is it's going to make a lot of progress. I see no particular reason, uh, although it's been mostly advocated by progressives, why it should be confined to progressives. Um, and I think that if you move to a national popular vote, um, you know, the I would think that ranked choice voting would accompany it in a way that that's very logical. I, I've also never thought that it would be the worst thing in the world to have two rounds of an election, um, but that has pitfalls as well. But I'm, I'm a little hopeful about ranked choice voting. Is there any concern, when I when I have spoken about um, the Electoral College, the National Popular Vote, one objection or not even objection, just complication is, you know, right now our presidential elections are 50 individual state elections. And would you have, would you have to just kind of revamp the entire election system itself um, and have a, tr a single federally run election to make this work? Um, and, you know, could that come with its own pitfalls? I think the answer is you would have to have something close to that, and yes, it would come with its own pitfalls. I, I, you know, I, I think that you would, you would certainly have to have um, a set of, even if you didn't have a centralized national administration, you would have to have a set of fairly strict guidelines. I mean, you know, could you have an election, a national popular vote, for example? And, and have suffrage rules be different in different states? Um, the answer is probably no. Um, could you have a national election and have uh, voter ID requirements vary? You know, the answer is probably no. And this has been a concern that, uh, that people who are worried about, about reform have voiced for a long time. There is something to it there would be pitfalls to, uh, you know, a national administration. On the other hand, um, having an efficient and modernized national election administration doesn't really seem like uh, something that is beyond the reach of this country. I mean, India has a very good national uh, elec election system. Mexico's got a pretty good one too. Um, and a number of other countries have been able uh, to, to carry it off. And um, it might serve the additional purpose of um, encouraging the formation of a professionalized election administration and kind of election civil service in this country that could solve all sorts of problems. For example, like the ones that um, I don't know whether you're in New York, Jamal, Jamal but the, the kind of election problems that, they, that they're having in New York State, and which they always have in New York State. Uh, and it's not a red state trying to engage in certain kinds of suppression. There's just not a professionalized administration there. One question from, from Karen Ribner. Why do we have elections when the electoral vote can overturn the popular vote? Why even have a popular vote? Um, <laughs> I, well, I, th I think we have a popular vote because that's where we believe legitimacy comes from. We believe that the legitimacy of the government comes from the consent uh, and support uh, of the people. If we, you know, um, and most of the time it has worked out all right that the popular vote and the uh, electoral vote uh, come out in the same direction. But 
Um, I think we have a popular vote for legitimacy. And then the question becomes, if the popular vote result differs from the electoral college result, does that delegitimize the government? So one thing that is, if you talk about these things on the internet for any um, length of time, if you, I'm, I'm sure you've encountered this as well. Uh, this, uh, there's this, this idea that the, the misfire, the minority result um, is sort of what was intended and that, um, uh, you know, the, how do I, how do I phrase this? It's, it's sort of, that's the system you know if a, if a if a someone becomes president um, without winning a majority of their vote that's just how things are supposed to work out that's just what was designed and you you shouldn't really complain about it and to me it seems that and please correct me if i'm wrong that the sense that this result is legitimate is a new is a newer thing like it doesn't seem like people were arguing 60 years ago that that were, the result would be legitimate. In fact, they were, everyone was worried about just the opposite, that no one thought that this was the kind of outcome that you would want the system to produce. No, no I, I, you know, I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I think that in past elections, I mean, going back historically, um, you know, after John Quincy Adams became president when Jackson led in the popular vote, there wasn't even a majority in it, but, um, you know, uh, Qu John Quincy Adams was vilified for his entire presidency as being an Ill illegitimate president. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, after 1876, was referred to as his fraudulency. Um, so, you know, I, I, th I, I think uh, I think that this re this recent claim that that it is legitimate, that's the way the system is supposed to work, is, is mistaken. I think it's just mistaken. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, as I understand it, the founding fathers never intended for there to be a two-party system. Doesn't the fact that we have a two-party system divide the nation? And if so, what do what do we do so that we aren't constantly at odds? Oi. <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> Jamel, would you like to take that question? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, they never intended a two-party system, but our the, our, this, a lot of the structures of our uh, electoral systems um, push things in the direction of a two-party system and the parties themselves. I mean, I think that this also has to be said. Um, although there were two-party systems in the 19th century, that was starting to crumble in the late 19th century. And one of the things that's, I think, important about the history of parties is recognizing that the two dominant parties conspired at the end of the 19th century and since to try to deter third and fourth parties from forming and gaining strength. It's not an accident that we have just a two party system. Now, once we have such a system, how can we keep things from being so antagonistic and divided? I don't know the answer to, but I'm sure that Jamel does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have an answer to that, to, that, to that either, although in kind of keeping with something we said earlier, it does seem like you know institutions like the electoral college may heighten the the division that's already there that there are, you know just because there's a two-party system doesn't mean there has to be these levels of hyper polarization in partisanship and the extent to which both camps see the other as sort of like monolithic and see uh you know political you know see it as you know if i Political contestation is not just zero sum, but like you know, uh, California is against uh, is against my side, or or New York is against my side, or uh, Oklahoma is against my side. That, that 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 kind of thing does is a function of just the way we are are doing our presidential elections and encourages a kind of you know combative thinking. Um, Wes Montgomery asks. Uh, supposing that we were to achieve election of the president by the popular vote, do you think a threshold should be set, e.g. 50.1% 50 .1 by which a candidate is elected president? Why not require that a winning candidate must achieve at least 50.1% of the popular vote, but failing that, the top two vote-getters would face off against each other in a runoff election one month after election day? I'd be fine with that. 
I would be absolutely fine with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the by amendment and amendments of that period put it at 40%. And I think actually that's probably too low. So I think that's something like what West Montgomery is advocating there would be perfectly fine. That's how they do elections in some statewide or Senate elections in states like Georgia, where you have a, um, uh, you know, you have the, a jungle race and then the top two vote getters get on. If no one clears 50%, the top two vote getters go on to another election. Um, Terrence Rose asks, uh, does any other country have a system similar to the US? And if not, why? Um, to my knowledge, no other country has a system similar <laughs> to the US. We, this is a feature of American democracy that, that not only never imitated by another country, it's actually never been imitated by one of our own states. Uh, and I think the reasons uh, why are, you know, emerged from the rest of this conversation. And uh, it's, a, it's a complicated kind of opaque uh, system that uh, doesn't do a very clear translation of popular opinion or the popular will into uh, political outcomes. And I think I think a lot of other places have, have recognized that. There were, in, in Latin America in the early 19th century, there were a number of places that used two-tiered indirect elections. You know, you don't vote for the member of Congress, you vote for some electors who vote for, uh, for members of a, of a legislature, but that disappeared 150 years ago. I think we have time for one more question. So this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, what circumstances would need to be in place for you to trust a reimagining of the U.S. Constitution? And just to, to I guess, uh, shape this question a little bit, I, I suppose, you know, what we've been talking about is just constitutional reform. And I think a lot of people are just wary of the idea of tinkering with the Constitution in any way um, at this point in time for a variety of reasons, some because they think it's perfect, some because they don't, don't think that anyone has the capacity to do it. Um, but the reason, but I think there's that, I think there's that real sort of fear of what might happen if you tried to. No, and, and I, I, I sympathize, uh, with that, you know, with that fear, um, and with that concern, but I think, I think I just, oh, I would add two things, you know, in, in response to that, or part of, part of the reason I'm sympathetic with constitutional reform, the first the first is that the Constitution gets changed anyway. It gets changed by the courts. And that's been true for 200 years. I mean, whatever the originalists say. Um, in fact, the interpretations of the Constitution have changed over time. The second is, you know, when I go and read the debates of the framers or the people who, or, or the people who produced other constitutional amendments, like you know, the very important 13th, 14th, 15th amendments. Um, you know, but to, going back to the framers themselves, these were pragmatic people. They were, I mean, they had a long run vision, but I, I don't think they were trying to respond to the structures of, of their era and trying to create um, a decent and reasonable government for that era. I don't think that, I don't think they would ever, I don't have, I don't think that Madison would ever have imagined that a, a country so vastly different would still be using the same basic document and be afraid to modify it. I mean, one of the things that they said about the, in fact, after the debates was they were closing the debates about, about, about the electoral college with they, you know, they said, uh, Eh, you know, this, this may not be our best work. And, you know, and, and, no, and a lot, and number of them came out, you know, Madison was critical of it, severely critical of it, not too long after, but a lot of the framers thought, eh, you know, this isn't, this isn't so good, but Washington will be president for the next eight years. And besides, we put in an amendment provision in the constitution so that we can change it if it doesn't work. Um, the amendment provision they put in was, I think, too hard. But I, I think that they would have been sympathetic with the thought of reimagining the Constitution. I think our time is up. Um, thank you, Professor Kesar. Uh, and our host is back. Okay. Well, thank you, Jamel. It's been a very enjoyable conversation. Likewise. Yes, this, was this has been terrific.
I do have one last question, which is not included in our Q&A box, and that is for you, Professor Kesar. We always ask all of our authors if there's anything you're currently reading, and if so, could you please share that with our viewing audience? Well, I'm going to I'm going to sort of not be confined to one book. I'm reading two books. Absolutely. Of, of, actually, I have, to, I have to glance for a second at the author. <laughs> oh, no, okay, now I remember. I'm reading two books that are vastly different. One is uh, the late Bernard Balin's uh, book about early American settlement called The Barbarous Years, uh, the piece of early American history by a great historian. Um, and then I'm also reading, and this sounds like a, a setup, but it, it's not. I'm also reading a novel by Roy Neal called The Electors. Um, and is about members of the Electoral College in a fancied uh, great international crisis. So I'm reading both of those and they're both very good. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Kesar. Thank you very much, Jamel. And of course, thank you to everyone who's attended this event. On behalf of Politics and Pros, um, hope you all have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.